Welcome to In the Quiet today. This is the third in our series, our mini series of what it means to practice the prayer of silence. Today I have a very short reading for you from The Silent Life by Thomas Merton. This is an old, old copy of it, uh, picked up somewhere in a, in a, a used bookstore. Um, and if you ever get a chance to get it, I would highly recommend it. He talks about the monastic life, um, but it ha and many people obviously gain much from it without being monks. I'm not a monk. Um, but he talks ab about monastic peace here, and I'd like to read a little passage of it to you um, that really goes, it correlates very well with what we're talking about in contemplative centering prayer. He's talking about the light, the light that we need, that we look for, uh, to shine through us, the light of God. And he says, light can only dawn in our hearts when we renounce our determination to rebel against the infinite will of God, accept reality as he has willed it to be, and place our wills at the service of his perfect freedom. It is when we love as he loves that we are pure. When we will what he wills, we are free. Then our eyes are opened and we can see reality as he sees it, and we can rejoice with his joy, because all things are very good. Now, I chose that little passage because it's, um, I, I think that that's a difficult thing to do. Always obeying his will, always walking in the stride. It's like, really, the only person who was able to do that perfectly was Jesus Christ, fully man and fully God. Uh, yet, uh, the scriptures call us to a life um, where Paul says, be perfect as I'm perfect. Um, we're called to obedience. We're called to love others as God loves us. These are words that seem to just easily fall off, off our lips. But if we really reflect upon them, how do we get there? And how do we do that? Um, well, I want to talk uh, just a couple minutes today and stir up some thoughts and reflections in you about contemplative prayer because contemplative prayer is a route. It's like one of the highways that we can take or the byways, uh, the lowlands, to, um, to find this place where we can walk in greater and greater dimensions of God's love for him, for others, and even for ourselves. So contemplative life, what, what is contemplation just to um, revisit that again? Um, I'm not interested in doing a full teaching here about contemplation, but just in the way of review, contemplation is, is the wordless communication or wordless communion is a better way of saying it that we can have with our maker. Um, we can have that kind of connection or communion. Contemplation allows us to go beyond the boundaries of our words, beyond language, beyond the boundaries of our own strength and um, our, our own love, our own resources. And as we develop this um, practice of embracing silence, God, God does that like a... Well, Merton calls it a purging process, uh, like maybe a sifting process where we, uh, those things that once held us, uh, that grip us, that distract us, that we're clinging to, uh, our hands slowly open. We slowly move toward a place of surrender and ability to let them go and let God do his work in us. Um, you know, Merton goes deeply into this book and talks about um, the contamination of the city, uh, the contempus mundi, you know, the, 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 the contempt for the world, where it's not a hatred for the world or um, a, 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 a disassociation with the city proper, but it's more metaphoric, you know, where uh, instead of the kind of pastoral, simple life of just... Um, living more naturally and more organically uh, in, in peace and in childlike faith before our Lord, uh, the city or the world, as Merton calls it, and St. Paul calls it that, that too, has a, a way of kind of getting 
under our skin. Um, you know, um, I almost want to say like, have you walked through places where you have, or watched television shows or watched a movie where you've emerged and you felt dirty, right? You felt uh, like, I, why did I watch that? Or why did I go there? There's kind of a, um, a darkness, a darkness. And that's what Merton talks about when he talks about getting free from that, not to dis disassociate ourselves from people or the beauty of uh, our towns and our cities, and but to um, get free of, of the slavery to and the oppression of those things. Um, so contemplative prayer allows us to do that, this, but the key with it is not, there's not a formula to contemplative prayer. Whereas we have the words specifically of the Lord's prayer in front of us and we can recite them together in a participatory way. In contemplative prayer, it's much more an individual type uh, I mean, you can sit in silence with other people, but in contemplation, it's you dwelling in the presence of God and allowing him to reveal himself to you. And so often the Lord is concealed. It's like, you know, we see him in the beauty of nature and the birds singing and uh, the breeze blowing and the beauty of scriptures, but very often he is concealed and it's not his fault. You know, it's not like he conceals himself necessarily, but we, we're blinded. We don't have eyes to see. And contemplative practice allows us to, ha to, to be free and to open up our eyes. It's like scales can fall from your eyes. And all of a sudden you have a deeper revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ and in you and in the earth and he in you and you in him. Um, and so the silence in this kind of prayer is kind of like an echo. The silence, I should say, reveals an echo. What What is that echo? Uh, I, I, I see it or I hear it as an echo that resounds through my being. And I believe it resounds through yours as well. Um, it's the echo. It's the echo of longing. The longing for him the longing to know, the longing to know and be known. And so much covers up that, that sound that we barely even hear the echo of it. But when we get into silence and the prayer of silence, we get into contemplative practice on an ongoing basis, that echo becomes a loud resounding trumpet within us. And um, our purpose and our sense of walking and dwelling with the living God seems to catalyze and become uh, more of a reality than something we just intellectualize or you know, know because it's been taught to us or know because, well, we believe it. But that belief moves into a daily life in a fresh and life-giving way. If we keep returning to that place of wordless communion, if we're faithful to the practice of contemplation, um, we do begin to walk in increasing dimensions of freedom. Why? Well, many reasons, but one I'll give you today before we close is that the Holy Spirit, frankly, just does a better job of knowing us and showing us ourselves than we do. Um, in some traditions, we call it the conviction power of the Holy Spirit, the one that I grew up in. Um, the Holy Spirit can reveal and will reveal our innermost motivations, the judgments we make, the sin in our life, the flaws, our deepest needs, and our deepest beauty and joy. You know, people deal with different things. Some people who are listening right now might be thinking, all I ever see in myself are the flaws and the sin. I thought that worm theology is like on my back. And then there's others who are listening who, who, who never see that. They never see their own flaws or their own weaknesses or sins. It's just kind of blind to it. Well, this is why it says, I say the Holy Spirit can do a better job of it than we can. Because as we place ourselves and create space, 
for the quiet, the Holy Spirit will meet us there. And in the quiet, we will find him and find ourselves in ever-increasing ways. Have a great day, friends. I'll talk to you again later.